here we are now with another episode of the Andrew Lake podcast. Today I'd like to talk about The Abolition of Man, which is a book by C.S. Lewis. But before we launch off into that, I have a quick anecdote. Recently, we mentioned on here in one of the episodes the problem of plastic and what it does for the environment and the products that we get. And I was talking about that moment of realizing that plastic is bad for the environment and I should probably reduce my plastic use. So, personal update. (laughs) Today I got ear cleaners, which had a paper stem. Instead of being made of plastic, they were made of paper. And on on the packet, it said, recycled paper stem ear cleaners. And it came in a plastic packaging (laughs) One step at a time. This book, The Abolition of Man, by C.S. Lewis, well, my mum called it a, a thriller, or a psychological twister, which it pretty much is, in some ways. And C.S. Lewis, what can we say about this man? What can we say about C.S. Lewis? No doubt a powerful intellect, no doubt a extraordinary mind, and very well read. And really, The Abolition of Man, this book, my core comment about it is that he has a very clear, or at least complex, understanding of multiple large concepts, but he doesn't quite get them to flow together and meet together, and he's struggling in this book. It's almost like a struggle to fit the pieces together, like these multiple machines, these big complex webs that he's trying to get to work together, and he understands that they need to work together, and also He can see their limits. He can see what's wrong with them. He knows them so intimately, he can see the line in which, once it's crossed, they break down. And that is why it's titled The Abolition of Man, because this idea of what is a man, he's piecing together with these big, big intellectual systems, I guess you would say, or... Or let me just give you an example. Let me just give you the list of what has jumped out at me. It's it's things like the education system, the value structures, multiple value structures, morality, empiricism and the scientific method, theology. And of course, within theology, Christianity. So these big intellectual pillars, he understood very well. He was very well read on them. He had complex ideas. He had deep historical understandings. And history is another one. History is something that we can put in there. This man was aware of the world histories. And he was very attuned to the significant events that had formed the culture of his time. But my comment is that he didn't quite get them to to merge together and to fluidly interact with each other. And, well, the answer is, it's metaphysics. He needed to go beyond. He needed to step out of all the ladders and the pitches. And he needed to step out of the intellect. And metaphysics does that for you. Metaphysics does that for the intellect. And he even has his own understanding of metaphysics. It's not like we could have gone to him and say, hey, C.S. Lewis, there's this thing called metaphysics. And then all of a sudden, ah, great. Now all of my pieces of the puzzle come together perfectly. Now that you've told me this one last thing that I'm missing. 
It's never that black and white. And also, it's easier, I, I, I have to come back to this, I have to say this, I know I've said this before, but we have to acknowledge that it's easier for us to be talking about him now that we have the benefit of hindsight, now that we have so much more that has come since his time. We are all tomorrow's food, as Ken Wilber says. And boy, tomorrow... If you could see what's coming, we are just going to be flies on the cows of an flies on the ass of a cow, <laughs> if I can put it in those sort of terms. All of our knowledge is going to look like kindergarten play to to tomorrow's thinkers, to tomorrow's beings. But that's that's a different. That's a bit of a rabbit hole. Let's just plant a flag there for if futuristic speculation or understanding our place in the grand scheme of things as a as a rabbit hole we don't want to go down here we want to we want to be paying respect to the intellect of cs lewis seeing where he went wrong understanding what he's saying in his books and really just seeing what what's the juice in there and there's so much juice that comes from this man this man really is, he really was admired by so many of his students. So many, so many of his followers and so many people listened to him and turned to him for meaning and understanding. And not, in, not just in this book, The Abolition of Man. This is just one of his many non-fiction works. And of course, he's also got the fiction works of Narnia, and perhaps we can talk about those at some point. I'd love to talk about those. We could even we could even do a whole series on Narnia because I love those books so much. And there is a lot of meaning in those narratives. There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of meta narrative. There's a lot of archetypal kind of themes throughout those. So these parts this book this book the abolition of man it has these parts and it the tone comes across it's like this cry of look how everything isn't working even though he can articulate it and describe it so clearly it's a very strange combination to be complex and in some ways very clear and yet unable to make things flow smoothly. And this book, The Abolition of Man, it starts with a comment about a textbook. Now, does that sound familiar? You know anyone else who starts by critiquing the education system? <laughs> I can think of some, but I'm not going to mention them just here. Now, the, the person who, this person who is concerned with the education system is concerned because he's a teacher and he can see the significance of how ideas and belief systems or perspectives or all of that sort of how we make sense of the world stuff, how it moves between different people how it's culturally relevant, how it's culturally specific as well. And he's very much involved in the education system and he's talking about this textbook and he's sort of keeping it ambiguous so that it could be a specific textbook which he's talking about. But then, of course, he goes much larger than that and he's talking about a textbook it is a specific textbook, but also it's it becomes like this thing of it could be almost any textbook or he could be talking about a different textbook if we just didn't even know which the specific textbook he was talking about. And he talks about the, the intentions of the teachers that wrote it, the effect that it has on the students and how it doesn't quite measure up and how there's a point where values and morality they start to dissolve 
So he has this education system understanding and he's describing the function of this book and then he moves into values of what is important, what is right and what is wrong. How do we make sense of the world? What is good, true and beautiful? And the morality, well that's an extension of the values. When we talk about values we always come up very quickly about morality and he was very concerned with morality. C.S. Lewis was always asking, what is right? What is wrong? And he's deep enough to even say, he's philosophical enough to even say, how can we even know if we can know how to be making the decisions of what's right and wrong? And that's the sort of cognitive string that you get in his books. They're these complex, well, how can we know? Do we know? It's all, it's almost like that old joke of, have you seen this on the TV show where someone, I think it's, you know, one of these famous American sitcoms where it's all about uh, who's going out with who or who's in love with who, these these sort of sitcoms. And, and the you know, the boy and the girl, they get together and then it's a secret and no one knows. And then someone finds out and they say, well, they don't know that we know. <laughs> and they don't know that they know. And then someone else knows. And then they say, well, they don't know that I know that they don't know. And they don't know that I. And it just becomes this big, long string. Now, that as a joke is a cognitive structure that actually applies to the metaphysics of morality. Can you get your head around that? Can you understand it's how can we know what's right and wrong? How can we know if we can know what's right and wrong? And the answer to that, well, how can we know that? So how can we know that the answer to how can we know if we can know what's right and wrong is right or wrong. <laughs> so you see, see, this is the sort of this is the sort of trip you go on if you <laughs> if you read the abolition of man. Now I, I'm sitting here because I love it. I I I can take these sort of cognitive. I I, I guess you call it a cognitive trip or a or a mind bender with like this is fun. And I come at as at as playful, and I say, "Yeah, let's get let's get really philosophical, and let's get really mind twisting on this game." And and of course, this is why my mum was saying, "Well, this is a thriller. I don't really like it. It's too much of a mind twister." And she'd sort of, you know, crink, crinkle her eye a little bit and go, "Oh no, no, I couldn't. I could only get halfway through it. No, you read it. You would like it. This sort of thing, or your father would like that sort of book." So so that's the difference, but it's definitely in this book. And then when it comes to empiricism, now do you know what empiricism is? The hard sciences? It's basically stuff. It's the Newtonian physics. It's how do we observe the physical world, matter, and then put a number on it, a measurement on it, an equation on it. How do we quantify it? So if we say we cool water and at a certain point it goes from a liquid to a solid, well, we can say, well, when it does that, let's just put the number zero on that. And then if we heat the water and at a certain point the liquid becomes a gas, well, we can say, now, now let's just put another number on that and we'll say that's number 100. And then between all those, we can divide 0 to 100 into 100 degrees, cents, fragments. Well, we just call them degrees. That's how we get Celsius. So that numbers with, as, as a measurement of what you can see with your eye or perceive in any sort of way, is an example of empirical sciences. And he was really, he was really aware of this. The scientific method was, was real to C.S. Lewis. 
And that's what made him so complex. That's what made him so deep. Because a lot of the religious apologists, which he did become, he became a Christian, a lot of them didn't tackle science in his day, in their days, in that period, as respectfully as C.S. Lewis, as is needed to. So this, the, the, the worldview of reconciling science and religion, it's, we, we can't forget, we cannot forget, that is a really important point in human history, in human intellect. We sit here now with grand sweeping metaphysics, with mysticism, with meditation, with beautiful, playful cognitive lines, with navigating multiple value structures, multiple levels of consciousness. It's wonderful. Thank God we arrived. It's so beautiful. But we can't forget that there was a point when this religion and empirical science, I mean the hard science, sciences, they were the, the, the two dogs in the boxing ring. Now, it was only for a short period, because before this, science and theology wasn't differentiated like it was in the 20th century. And right when C.S. Lewis was doing his thing and he was alive was when it was this picture of a boxing ring. Now, can you imagine a boxing ring of one boxer and then there's another boxer and everyone's going, yes, this guy's going to win. No, this guy's going to win. And they're really punching each other. There's a force there. That's science and, the, that's science and empirical Sorry, that's religion and empirical science of the 20th century. That's the theme that's going on there. And he wrestled with it. C.S. Lewis wrestled with that. He got in there. He got dirty. And he was very clear about it. He was very respectful to science. And this just made his theology, which was another big component, it's another big pillar of his, it made his theology so much richer. And in a sense, he, well, he says sort of famously that he reluctantly became a Christian. He was dragged kicking and, kicking and screaming, in a sense, metaphorically, to become a Christian. But the, the intellect or the processes and the whole, the whole game of in and out and what what wins over what and how these big ideas fit together led him to become a Christian. And he sprung off his fight with, well, I wouldn't say fight, but he sprung off this empiric empirical science discussion into his theology. So it's not a... It's not a clear rhetoric, rhetoric. He doesn't, he doesn't speak in a way which is... Now, rhetoric, we, we need to understand rhetoric as well, which is, it's, it's a rational way of talking or a rational way of thinking. And in essence, the, 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 the rhetoric debate is... Well, let, let me tell you what it looks like from the bird's eye view, from the mystic's point of view. And then we can maybe zoom back in time and have a guess as to how it felt for C.S. Lewis. For, for me, me personally, when I have rhetoric come to mind or when I'm using rhetoric as a web of analysis or it's something that I'm using to like a lens, I see two people. And they're both arguing or discussing the same thing. Let's say, let's say they're talking about God. So they, they both agree and they both understand that they're talking about God. Now with this word God, one person on one side has a collection of ideas and words. 
in essence, that's what they have, which is associated with God. Now, he's going to say those words and those ideas, and then the other person is going to hear him. Now, of course, this other person also has a set of ideas and words to go with this word God, which is different to person A, person A and person B. Person B is different to person A. Now, when we're talking about debate or an argument, the person who wins the argument is the one who can use the other person's words to build up more of his own picture, to build up his more of his own ideas of God. So a good debater will start using the other person's words and show how those words actually support the original idea of what is God or God, if we're discussing that. So this crossover, it's it's quite abstract in my mind when I hear this, when I when I listen to this. It's very I mean my experience of words these days is very oh it's very I'd say mystical for want of a better word. It's 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 like clouds. It's it's washy. I'm listening things flow differently. So when I'm hearing these words and there's a, an overlap and there's not an overlap, then that's that's rhetoric by the that's like a mystical version of what rhetoric is. Now in terms of a rational and what was rhetoric like in C.S. Lewis's day, or or even before, because it's been around for, for thousands of years. This goes way back to well, in a sense, the the Socratic method has a rhetoric well, let, let's not go there. That's a bit of a tricky differentiating the Socratic method and rhetoric. Ooh. Let's say, let's say, if we, we only need to say enough that there is a difference there, but they're related. In the, the experience of C.S. Lewis and rhetoric, it's more like, let, let me set up an idea or a problem, and then let me say, well, here is one possible solution to the problem, but it's not adequate. And then here's another solution, possible solution to the problem, but it's, it's also not adequate. So now we've got two possible answers, but they're not quite right. And the good rhetoric debater will then say, now here's the real answer. I've shown you two answers. Here's the third answer, which is the real answer. And I convince you on the third because I've set up a problem and, and the problems that C.S. Lewis was dealing with, with was, well, how do you square religion and science? Or does God exist? Or was Jesus who he said he was? How do values move through students? How does a human being come into a perspective of the world? These, these are huge questions. These are big philosophical questions. And there's a, there's a bit of this back and forth of this rhetoric, which is, here's a problem, here's a dummy solution which doesn't work, here's another one, and then here is the... At times, he doesn't have the third one. He doesn't give the actual problem. And this, funnily enough, sometimes sounds like, it sometimes looks like comparative religion. Now, was C.S. Lewis a postmodern? Was he comparative in his analysis, in his discussions? It would appear that way from, from if you squint your eyes and you sort of t tilt your head a little bit and you scratch your head, then sort of yes. But I don't think he got there. I don't think he was quite there. Because he, he couldn't jump across the precipice of postmodernism which is which is this this is if you want to be a postmodernist you want to be a pluralist and you want to do comparative religion this is the precipice you have to cross which is you can build an argument for why something is true and you can also 
build an argument for why, for why something is not true. But then you can have the third step, which is because I can argue both, I'm going to choose one of them. And that third step is something that's left out for C.S. Lewis. He only has the first two steps. In a sense, sort of like the David Foster Wallace postmodernism, but he's he's in a different category. I don't think there's much of a there's not much use in bringing him into this conversation. That that that's a different. There are different complexes to his postmodernism and his pluralism there. So, and and they're 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 from different time periods in in a sense. I mean, they're only what, like 30 or 40 years apart. But those 40, those 30 to 40 years are a lot because a lot happens in that time. I mean, the 60s happened in that time. So, and, and the 60s is really the postmodern revolution, the real first wave of postmodernism. Uh, po- <laughs> postmodernism. Maybe potanism? <laughs> I'm just making up words now. No, so let, let's leave David Foster Wallace aside, but I don't think C.S. Lewis got there. I don't think he felt comfortable enough to to make that jump. And, and I can see this uh, cognitive line of you can say something's true or you can say something's not true, but then you have to choose. Well, which one do you want to argue? And you can't let it eat you up that you can argue both. Now, that that circle, that three-step process of true or not true and choose, that actually goes back. This is, this is what has it spring into a snake which is eating its own tail. It goes back to this thing of they don't know that we know that we know. They don't know that we know that we know. <laughs> and so... You can then say, well, I can choose whether it's true or whether it's not true, but how do I choose that choice? Because I can also choose that to be right or wrong. <laughs> so this this circular this circular thing of postmodernism really really didn't really didn't get quite there with C. S. Lewis. Now, what was it like to be him? That's a bigger question. I'm just talking here about the abolition of man and this this thing of, oh, things sort of uncoil and unravel when you understand enough about each of these big pillars. That is the abolition of man. That's really what he felt. That's why, that's where this title comes from. It's how can we have a morality and when he when he says that he says it saying i really don't know and when someone who is really smart really intelligent very well read very complex in his ideas very very understanding of science and philosophy and religion and all these massive things of human understanding when someone says that that really is a statement that's that's a very different I don't know that than one of his students saying I don't know. When one of his students hasn't read Beatrand Russell or Beetroot Russell, I like to call him, or the Quran or the the Bible or any of the commentaries on them, and they don't understand the rationalism or the scientific method or the new atheist movements well that's like i don't know as in i haven't got an intellect i haven't thought about it and that's different to what c.s lewis is saying which is i i don't know what is man if he's not his value structures if he's not his morality if he can't answer these questions of existential yearning or the existential intuition with either science or religion then what is he he's he's nothing he's gone it's the abolition of what man is 
And of course, he's exactly right in some ways, but he didn't have the guts to step off. He couldn't step off. I don't think he knew about meditation and mystical experiences and mysticism more in, in a more esoteric way, which would have brought him to be more comfortable with having these thought systems flow together more freely. Because when you can step back, when you can remove yourself, then it's not that the parts are any more or less complex, it just becomes easier to relate them. Like, will I, will I ever have as deep a theological understanding as C.S. Lewis? Whew, I don't know if anyone will, like really. Like theology, and, and more specifically like Christianity, like, he really knew his Christianity. He really studied it. What's the difference between seeing the beyond and going beyond? Because the title of this book, The Abolition of Man, seems to hint that C.S. Lewis found it. He found the beyond through his intellect, through his knowledge, because it was so vast that he approached the boundary. But what's the difference? What would it have looked like? How would he have spoken if he'd been able to jump off and to really live the intuition that he was having? and then come back and to reassess everything that he's doing. How would he have spoken? Now, I haven't heard him speak. I don't know if there is footage of him speaking. And he lives in, he, he was alive in an age just before the internet. So, I believe it would have been, he, he really would have had a lot to say. I mean, I, I mean, this is a big if. Like, have you, do you ever do that history game of what if? And you look back on history and you say, well, what if? What if he had have been alive? What if they hadn't have invaded? What if they had have signed the treaties? We can play that game until the cows come home. What if C.S. Lewis had have lived in the age of the internet? And we would have had more footage of him talking and his connection with people and his presence. Well, that's... that's we're sitting here trying to understand a man from just one of his books and that's a very large stretch that's a very large gap at least if you hear someone's tone of voice and you hear how they put ideas together you can sense a little bit more there's a lot more personality there's a lot more of the personal subjective experience coming through now i'm not saying he was tortured by his intellect in the same way that maybe someone like David Foster Wallace was. No, not at all. I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't say that CS Lewis had a a bad inner world or a bad subjective experience of reality. I don't get that. No, I'm not feeling that. It's just that he didn't quite go as far as he could have if he'd able to he'd been able to let go of so much knowledge. And it comes up in, in other titles. I mean, there are other books which are sort of like in the same vein. So there's this book called Mere Christianity. So just, just the title, just looking at that title, Mere Christianity. It's almost like he's defining it by what it's not. And in a sense, he does actually define it in a lot of funny ways. There's this funny way of... You can get this sense that you know what something is by saying all the things that it's not. And then there's also his book, The Weight of Glory. And these are these are complex things. These are... There are big questions in there. And like the... Well, well, in essence, the weight of glory is, well, like the abolition of man, 
You're a human being. You're not an animal. And the difference is that the man has a world perspective, to be speaking simply for the sake of this conversation. The difference between a man and an animal is that he has a world perspective. And the abolition of man is that that world perspective collapses. There's no boundary around it. There's no way to contain it. There's no way to understand it. It's this, it's an illusion to be speaking simply. And then that also, in, in the weight of glory, it is, well, what, what is the glory of being a human? What is the glory that humans have that animals don't? And that is their perspective. That is their ability to talk, to have these complex ideas, to evolve through value structures, to consciously choose behavior and morality and talk about theology and scientific method and, and empiricism and to measure things. This, this whole thing which we might call, which we can call here the noosphere, which is all thought, that's the weight of the glory of humanity. And, and why is he calling it a weight? Why is he saying that in this title of this book? Now, of course, this book, it's, it's so hard to talk about these books in passing because they're very complex and they're very deep. Really, I wish he could have been a little bit more playful. <laughs> I wonder what his sense of humor would have been like. I wonder what, I wonder what C.S. Lewis would have been like around children. Now, even if we had the internet today, then he would have been talking about these ideas. Even if he was alive today, talking about talk, talking on the internet today is what I mean to say. Then we might not get much much footage of him playing with children anyway. And I, I just can't help wonder, what was his sense of humor like? What was his sense of playfulness like? Because that, whoa, that is a big part of the human condition. That is as big as science, as big as value structures, as big as the education system, as big as theology. Right along all these things, we can put playfulness or a sense of humor. Now imagine having the intellect of C.S. Lewis and having it go after reconciling theology and a sense of playfulness. Whoa. That would be something. That would be a trip. That would be a book to read. That would be the book to read. Oh, yeah, that really would have been something. So that's some thoughts on C.S. Lewis. I'm humbled. I always feel a bit funny to be... I, I guess it's not a critique. I'm not critiquing C.S. Lewis. I hope it doesn't come across that way. I know when, when we talk about intellectuals, it sometimes sounds like, oh, here's how you could have done it better. No, I, I hope it's not like that. I hope it's more of a, it's more in the vein of like, what if in history, or what if this, or what if that? And, and here's what jumped out for me for this, in this book. Now, you can read The Abolition of Man, and you can get something very different out of it, because it is that complex. It is that multifaceted kind of writing. So this has just worked, worked for me. This is just how, well, I guess it's how my set of words and ideas clashed or merged with this man's set of ideas. And he was a huge influence. He was a huge influence and still is and still could be. I mean, there, there are massive movies made out of his books. And I think I think probably he ended up becoming more famous for his fiction, for his children's books. So it might even it might even be a shock to you for you to learn that C.S. Lewis was this massive intellectual, 
This, he was actually for, first and foremost a, a non-fiction writer, and he was a professor. He was a, an educator. So he's more a philosopher than a a, a, a writer of or of worlds of fantasy. And fantasy is another big part of his his worldview. And there's a really a lot to say. I I, I think I'm going to do a series on on Narnia. At some point, that really would be, would be something, and we could do even a whole a whole series on C.S. Lewis's nonfiction. We could talk more about mere Christianity and the weight of glory, and and there's a whole bunch of others. And there's also also mentioned the Screw Tape Letters. Now that whoa, that is really something there. That's where he's. That's the letters of a senior demon, like a devil being sent to a junior devil. And in these letters, he's trying to tell him how to coerce and trick this this human into sinful nature. And you get this, it's it's a real mind twister. Like these, it's so deep and such a twisted such twisted con- cognitive shapes that ah, oh, I just get such a buzz out of it because you're reading this letter and then you get this sense of the person that he's sending because you don't get the letters, the return replies. You only get one side of the story, but you still get a sense of who the sort of devil, the person, well, the entity that he's writing to. And then on top of that, there's an even deeper sense, which is the person that they're talking about the man they're trying to coerce, the man they're trying to... Uh, what do you call when a devil tricks you? Eat your soul? The devil is trying to... I've forgotten the word. I've forgotten what, what it means, what the saying is. Ah, it's not coming to me. Maybe you know what it is. Basically, whenever a devil is trying to con you into becoming sinful... And then, so these three layers, you have these three layers, and then you realize that it's you. It's actually, wow, this is humanity, not just me specifically or the reader specifically, but this can be applied to anyone. So it's this, it's very deep, and it's, it's, so, it's, it's a short amount of words. So it's very dense. It's a very short book, as is The Abolition of Man. And yet there's so much in it. So... If you're going for something dense and something, well, well, here's a question for you. Do I recommend C.S. Lewis? Well, that's tricky. If you've, if you've transcended and you can laugh about the, <laughs> the, the cognitive roller coaster, then go for it. You'll love it. It's great. But if you haven't, if you haven't quite got that point and you're still, You've got some, you've got neuroses and you've got some confusion. You've got, well, it's so hard to talk in this sort of way. It's, let's just say that there's no way to either recommend or not recommend this sort of thing. But let me tell you, I've had so much fun with it. That, then that should be enough for it. If you like the sort of things I like, then you'll like it because it's, it's a roller coaster. <laughs> so. Maybe take that as the worst, <laughs> the worst book ad for C.S. Lewis. Oh, I'll also mention I don't get any money for this. I know I always say that, but I talk about these books just for the fun of it. And well, usually when someone talks about a book on the internet, it's because they're plugging it for an advertisement. But I mean, you can get you can get C.S. Lewis books from from the book fair for 20 cents or something or a dollar something like that or you can just pick it up at a second hand bookstore so these aren't these aren't these cut they're they're not the hot new best sellers these sorts of things I mean it was I mean how long ago did he how long ago did he die we gotta of course I don't know why I'm asking a question that you can just jump on the internet and find out born 1898 to 1963 so he died in the 60s 
early 60s. We didn't quite catch that postmodern wave, that coming avalanche. <laughs> so, yeah, what a, what a guy. So what we might do is finish with a spontaneous surprise meditation. C.S. Lewis might not have been experienced with meditation, but we are. So don't skip over this. Just, I know you might have had an idea of what you were going to do after listening to this. You might have had things to get on with. But just say, even if you haven't meditated today or this week, just say, I'm going to meditate now for just a few minutes. So if it's comfortable for you to do so, stop what you're doing, sit down, close your eyes, take a few soft breaths, relax your body, and just sit and be with what you are. Just allow whatever's happening right now, wherever you are, to happen. Accept your thoughts. Accept your feelings. And just notice what sort of sounds are in your mind. What sort of images are happening. And if there's a train of thought that is words, just allow it to happen and sit quietly for a few minutes. And that's all I have to say for now. <laughs>